Good evening. Thank you very much for that round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, it's, it works. You just have to ask for it, don't you? you ask and you shall receive. That's right. Well, tonight we're going to talk about the uh, third of my trilogy books. Um, it's um, uh, the first two were, uh, I think, uh, kind of curious. This one is vital, and so I'm going to try to emphasize some things about the book that were important, at least to me. But I like to start with this idea. <clears throat> How much has happened to you in the last 30 years? Almost my whole life. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> almost my whole life. <laughs> I, yeah, pretty good. Um, it's been almost my whole life, too, as a matter of fact. Um, a lot of things can obviously happen in 30 years. Uh, uh, the world changes so rapidly now anymore. Um, I used to think I was pretty techy, and now I'm finding out that I'm pretty uh, challenged by digital media anymore. It's becoming more and more difficult. Well, 30 years ago is when I wrote this little book right here, the third in the Prophecy Trilogy, and there shall be a new heaven and a new earth. And some things have changed since I wrote this book. Not the fundamental principles, but some of the finer points have changed, um, and all for the better. That is, rather than contradicting the thesis that was presented in the book, it really served, the changes really served to uh, support the basic thesis, even though some of the details changed. And I. Uh, uh, I want to do something, I'm going to kind of break my own rules here and read a little bit to you because I, I haven't read this stuff in probably 25 of those 30 years. So to go back is kind of like opening a time capsule for me and seeing what was going through my head and how much I understood then as compared to how much I understand now. And, and I really surprised myself, frankly, because I wrote something here that, that is just as informative, if, for example, what we're going to be talking about today, uh, just as informative as what I'm going to tell you, and it lays the groundwork. So bear with me while I read this. I'll try to do it without boring you. Publishing is a work that deals with information from Cut, the cutting edge of any discipline, and it's a risky business, scholastically speaking. If you're going to publish something that is relatively new, uh, you can be certain that somebody's going to come along and, and push off your pedestal, so to speak, and say, well, you didn't have that right. That was that you, you, you should have said it this way. Because time and new discoveries may reveal the folly of rushing to premature conclusions. 30 years later, I'm saying, yeah, that's, that's right, premature conclusions. However, if I'd have waited, who knows what, how the work would have been received. I don't know. It may appear almost foolhardy to use such information to substantiate an unorthodox and speculative point of view. And indeed, this is. Nobody else, even in the church since then, has ventured to take up this subject and publish on it. So 30 years later, I'm still in the same box that I was in before. Uh, and it's kind of lonely in there. Because um, I've invited people to publish and write on this. I've encouraged them to, but uh, no one has, else has ventured. Uh, to any real degree. From that perspective, any properly trained scholar would certainly hesitate, at the very least, before proceeding. If not, abort the project altogether for fear of ridicule or ostracism from the ranks of his fellows. However, as this author is, at best, 
simply a lay investigator making no claim to scholastic credentials which might be endangered by pub publishing speculative material, the thesis of this volume is presented for consideration, flaws and all. With the hope that it will in be enlightening to those who read it and encourage further inquiry into the subject by those uh, of more able intellect. I knew, I knew there were gonna be things that weren't right about this, but I had to make a choice. Do I publish and inform people 30 years ago, or do I just sit and wait until I'm absolutely sure of anything? Well, the, you know, uh, in the comic books and the movies, the hero launches ahead where angels fear to tread. You know, you don't, you can't make any progress if you're not willing to uh, take a few risks. In addition, my confidence in these concepts is sufficiently strong that I believe the primary thesis of this volume will stand the test of time, though some specifics in time may prove to be erroneous and be proven valid by future events. So that's the idea. There are some errors in this book. There are errors in all three books. There are errors in any book. But for the sake of people who have not yet read this book or have not yet taken my classes but will, I want to kind of clear the air a little bit about the differences so you can see what I believed then or what I thought I believed or knew then and what I have learned since. So. There's the 30 years idea. Now there's another little bit I need to read here before we go too much further. Um, really what I'm going to try to do here is, uh, for want of a better word, is to promote the sale of these books and the attendance to the classes because that's the only way I have to communicate to you the th basic concepts that I've been discovering all these years. Um, uh, my wife will tell you this makes us no living. In fact, sometimes it's a bit of a struggle um, because of the expenses involved in keeping the information out there. In the 30 years since I published these, this trilogy, the cost of publishing has gone through the roof. There was a time I could manage it out of the household budget. That's no longer the case. There was a time when the books went out of the bookstore like hotcakes, but that's no longer the case. So forgive me if this sounds like a sales pitch because it is a little bit. And let me give you a reason for studying this stuff. And it all comes out of modern revelation. In 1832, uh, a revelation called the Olive Leaf was given to Joseph Smith. The Lord gave specific instructions to the Latter-day Saints. And I give unto you a commandment that ye shall teach one another the doctrine of the kingdom. Teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you, that you may be instructed more perfectly in theory, in principle, in doctrine and in the law of the gospel, in all things that pertain unto the kingdom of God that are expedient for you to understand, of things both in heaven and in the earth and under the earth, things which have been, things which are, things which must shortly come to pass. Because of the scope, the title of the trilogy, this trilogy we've been talking about, could easily have been taken from this scripture that says, and truth is knowledge of things as they are, as they were, and as they are to come. This is the focus of these books. Um, in fact, these books are an attempt to fulfill the mandate, give, mandate given in the first scripture by suggesting new interpretations of past events Focus, focusing attention on what appears to be present ignorance of ancient events, customs, and conventions, and by analyzing future events 
and conditions in light of this proposed perspective. The Prophecy Trilogy series offers a new direction, a few tentative steps down an untrodden path. If these books can illuminate new vistas of knowledge, then the time and effort spent to prepare them will have been well spent. It is the author's hope that those who scan these pages will gather up these simple clues and then proceed to discover the answers to questions yet unasked as well as those still unanswered. Okay. That's my pitch. And, and as interesting as the books are, at least I hope they're interesting, the most valuable information is in the online classes. It's a lot easier to see and conceptualize also with the images. Yeah, the online classes have slides, animations, all sorts of things that make it clearer. I learned long ago that I can spend hours trying in print to explain something and I can do it in 10, 15 seconds of video. That's why Ryan's working so hard on these animations. So we'll have them. Anyway, so we come down we come down to the differences between what actually was what I wrote. Um, how can I list this? Then and now. What happened? Emmanuel Velikovsky wrote his book, Worlds in Collision. He wrote several books, Earth and Upheaval, Peoples of the Sea, Oedipus and Akhenaten, um, and a lot of interesting books. The key book, of course, is uh, er Worlds in Collision. And in Worlds in Collision, he proposed that, as I wrote in my first book, Venus in close proximity to the Earth was the origin of all the catastrophic events that we read about in Exodus. So that was Velikovsky's basic thesis, worlds in collision, just as um, um, a lot of early general authorities wrote the very same sort of thing. Uh, they didn't say worlds in collision, they called it the crack of matter um, and, and the, gosh, I've forgotten the word, but it's, they, they clearly say the same thing that Velikovsky did. Velikovsky, in his original work, intimated that the planet Saturn held the key to the very earliest histories uh, of the Earth. And a fellow by the name of Dave Talbot uh, was an early supporter of Velikovsky, picked up on that notion, did some research, and published a book called The Saturn Myth. And in the Saturn myth that, he, that was published by, I believe, Doubleday, he proposed that Earth, that Saturn stood above the Earth, um, above the Earth's North Pole. Uh, Saturn. And that it had, it had rings around it three sets of rings, my illustration is going to be pretty poor, and that there were these four streams that made the thing look like a bullseye. Um, and that the thing that made this unique is that Earth was a satellite of Saturn. But the unique thing is that it was poised over Earth's North Pole, so it it gave us the reason that all the planets and the stars and the sun and everything seem to rise in the east and set in the west is because of Earth's rotation. But if a body's sitting exactly over Earth's north pole, its rotational point, it would appear to be stationary. That was the first unique thing. 
And of course, it flies in the face of modern astronomical thinking. We don't see this in our solar system anywhere. So how did Talbot reach this conclusion? Because all the ancient records said that this thing was fixed and immovable in the heavens. Lo and behold, as Latter-day Saints, when we go to our scriptures, we see this very concept in modern revelation as well as ancient texts like the Bible. So I thought that very curious. The other thing, that, and the reason that this it was stationary is because of this polar alignment. Polar alignment. This is vital because that polar alignment not only allows it to be stationary, but it allows it to turn in the sky in a 24-hour period. Why? Because the Earth turns in 20... It doesn't matter what Saturn was doing, it's the Earth's rotation that causes this to happen. This created ideas such as a, a lighted crescent, something that we see everywhere in ancient cultures, but most particularly in the Egyptian culture, poor art, but you get the idea, where Egyptologists say this is the sun and the moon in conjunction. Well, the sun and the moon are never in conjunction. It doesn't happen. You can't, if the moon is, passes between the earth and the sun, you can't see it until it occludes the sun. And then you get a, uh, what's the word? Solar eclipse. Eclipse, thank you. <laughs> so. Plus, you wouldn't see a crescent on the moon when that happened. You wouldn't see the crescent on the moon. You see the light from the sun sparkling. Anyways, it's completely different. And the other thing, the other thing that Talbot said is that in this arrangement of planets, there was a visible column of light extending downward that looked like a pillar or a mountain or a, a highway or uh, the trunk of a tree, many different images that the ancients used. So there was a ladder. The, a ladder, that's right under the wood. A pillar of light. Now, if if we uh, if we look, and this is where it starts to sound like science fiction or fantasy, because if you look in fantasy writings, ancient and modern, we see this kind of imagery all the time. And the reason we see that is because it's a holdover from ancient tradition. Modern writers go into the ancient texts, they read about this stuff, and they adapt it for modern fantasy. What was one of the, oh, the other was the, uh, the, the cruciform figure. These were, this was called, uh, well, for want of a better word, we'll call it a cross. And, and even though, even though these items didn't appear individually, it looked like this most of the time. This was Talbot's thesis. Even though it looked like this most, most of the time, the ancients would take the image apart and selectively create the different parts of the image. For example, one of the, one of the others is the uh, sun sign, which was nothing but a circle with a ring around it. In alchemy, that symbol represents Saturn. Lo and behold, someone yanked my chain after I'd written this book and said, oh, did you know that that symbol's on the wall of the Salt Lake Temple? No, I didn't. I didn't know. Someone pointed it out, huh? I didn't know. I was, dis just like I just read, I was discovering this stuff, but I thought it was so important that I wanted to share what I was learning. Granted, I got some of it wrong, and we'll see how. 
even though these still work. So, this was the original theory then. Talbot struggled. His emphasis has been with the scientific community. Particularly astronomy. My effort has been singly and solely with Latter-day Saints. And I have depended largely on Talbot for these concepts. He has been the most prolific of the researchers and the most accurate. So I have followed him. I'm not making excuses. I'm simply explaining how it shakes out. So he was trying to convince the scientific community. But the idea of two orbs orbiting one another was just too much for him to uh, the scientific community to buy. Let's see if I can find this. I think you mean an, an alignment. An alignment, yeah. Well, they did orbit one another in, in the original effort to explain it. Here it is. A fellow by the name of Frederick Juniman, who's a chemist and a brilliant... Oh, you, that's right. You need to be... I keep thinking of this camera as an obstruction. You see, <laughs> I'm talking to you folks. This, I, I guess you can see that. This he called the barbell planet theory. And he explained that the combination of gravitational force and um, um, what's, the, what's the opposite? Um, um, centrifugal, is that what you said? And, and centrifugal force that forces things outward creates this model. I won't go to great explanation for it, but this was the only explanation, and the scientific community, community was not buying it. So, what did Talbot do? Well, he became discouraged. He, he stopped doing his research, he threw away his whole library, and just quit for a couple of years. Because he could not figure out how scientifically to substantiate this arrangement of planets. But I noticed something very interesting in this, and, and as long as we're on the subject, let's look at it here. You see that picture there? I hope they can see this on the cameras. It's going to be too close to focus. Um, anyway, it should be fine. anyway, if if you can't see it, buy the book. Okay, <laughs> you can order it from me. I told you it's going to be a sales pitch, and I wasn't kidding. <laughs> it's the only way I can communicate this thing, people. I've written it down. I can sit down with. 10 people uh, at a time, and it's going to take me the rest of my life to get through 100 people. Or else I can write a book, and 1,000 people can read it at the same time, or 10,000, which I wish they would. Anyway, this picture was drawn by Joseph Smith. And can you see from, from the cheap seats over there, can you see what the most prominent feature of this illustration is? It's easy to identify. What is it? Three planets. Three planets is one. What's the, but what, the what's unique? The alignment. They are stacked. I'll try to duplicate it here. Joseph Smith drew this picture and he showed these connections between them. But the dotted line that he puts through it is the key. He has a line at the bottom that's the plane of the ecliptic. That's the plane that all the planets rotate in around the sun, you see, like this. That, that line, horizontal line, represents the uh, plane of the ecliptic in the solar system. The dotted line is the declination, Are the, a, a planet most of the planets aren't aligned at 90 degrees to the plane of the ecliptic. They've, they're angled a little bit. And Joseph Smith got that right. But none of them look like this. He drew this, he drew this dotted line in here, and that's the key. It's obvious that Joseph Smith understood something very much like this Saturn Earth arrangement that Talbot was talking about. So that's what I wrote about in my book. 
one thing that could help is that the, the top one's bigger than the next one and they keep yeah. getting smaller. So if you look it up from the North Pole, do you see the, the rings? That you well, have? we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Joseph Smith drew them essentially the same size. Joseph was trying to introduce these concepts. Joseph was trying to explain the ancient symbol, the very same thing that I'm trying to communicate in these books. And here's this little illustration done by the hand of the prophet that has been marginalized in Mormonism because astronomers say nothing like that can happen. So these little young Mormon skulls full of mush a hundred years ago that went to the universities and said, well, I've been taught that Earth was part of a group of planets. That the astronomers said, no, 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 that's, abs that's myth, that's legend, that's nonsense. You can't believe it. And so when the kids got their sheepskin, when they rolled out of the university, their minds had been changed about this stuff. And then these kids, these young skulls full of mush, eventually become scholars, and they write informative stuff, uh, uh, important papers for Latter-day Saints. But they neglect to mention this because they now believe that had, that couldn't be because they were taught it couldn't be. But here comes Talbot and says, this alignment of planets created this unique stationary polar alignment that gave us all of these symbols. And you see all these symbols in every religion and every culture from time immemorial. It's not just in our scriptures, it's everywhere. It's all before Noah, right? If, if you know what to look for, I, I was just, my wife just bought some baby clothes and it had a boat with red, white, and blue. The boat is one of the symbols yeah. of the Polish the figuration, and then the colors, and then I think I saw it in uh, the Light Transformers symbol. I think it's Transformers, because Metacom. I, I can see it in that now. Well, it, it exists in our culture. It's hardly proof of anything, but it yeah. does show that those symbols are still there. And yes, yeah. it, it all appeared in the heavens before the time of Noah. There was a lot of it afterwards as well, right down to the time of Abraham. And that's why Abraham is hard. That's why Abraham go, had to go to the Egyptians. Their culture's taught about these things, just like every ancient culture, Hindu, uh, Maori, uh, Aztec, uh, Chinese, it doesn't matter. Native American, they all have, I go to these people in these cultures, this is a very interesting point. People in, that, that are well versed in their own particular culture who convert to the church are the first to see the value in these symbols because they say, Oh, oh yeah, I've been a Buddhist all my life and this is an important symbol and that one and that one and, and it means this, this, this and this. Oh yeah, that's right. And when I show them the connection to Mormonism, I've got them. They understand it. Polynesians, Native Americans, they say, wow, that's what I was taught in my childhood before I became a Mormon. Because all this stuff exists in these ancient... Anyway, that I digress. The point is that Talbot laid all this out, could not substantiate his research with a real mechanism for stacking these planets in this shish kebab manner in the heavens. So he said, you know, maybe I'm wrong, I'm right or wrong, nobody wants to hear it, I can't substantiate it, threw his library out, gave it all away, and quit. Till one day a guy by the name of Wall Thornhill Oh, and I wanted to mention one thing. I don't know if you'll be able to see that or not, but one of my early readers, who obviously was pretty uh, capable in metalwork, actually created this amulet that I could wear. And my wife is the one that uh, put it in this frame for me so I could have it. But I thought this was pretty amazing that they understood it well enough. And like I said, it does explain, if you, go through, if you go through this book, you'll see how this imagery does explain a lot. 
but it hadn't yet been refined. And that's where the point that I'm at now. One day, a fellow by the name of Wall Thornhill, Wallace actually, Wall Thornhill, walked into to, uh, Dave Talbot's office and said, uh, I'm from Australia and I'm a plasma physicist and I'm going to explain how your polar model can work. For a week he sat with Talbot and they discussed these things. Talbot immediately began to publish again. Only sadly, I'd already published my third book. This was like 10 years later after I'd published that third book. Maybe not quite 10, eight, something like that. And here was the refinement. The polar alignment was still there, but there were three planets, Talbot now said, Saturn, and in front of that, next in this stacked arrangement, was Venus, and next was Mars, all, all in decreasing sizes, and then the Earth was down here. But the defining feature was still the same. They shared this axis of rotation, which means Joseph Smith was probably drawing those three planets. But everybody that, that communicated that information in the LDS community said, well, this was the Earth and this, these were two orbs that were attached to it. Somebody got that notion in there. Maybe that's the way Joseph Smith described it. But the truth of the matter is, if you let this illustration, this one right here, thanks. If you let this illustration speak for itself, okay? The, the guy that communicated it to us is named Philo Dibble. He was responsible for, a, for eyewitness reports of many of Joseph Smith's early revelations. He was Joseph Smith's bodyguard. He was respected by President Brigham Young and the others. He came out with the saints and settled in Springville. And he was encouraged to uh, visit all the congregations of the church along the Wasatch Front in those days and exhibit the uh, relics of the restoration that he possessed. One of Joseph Smith's seer stones, the amulet that Joseph Smith wore when he was assassinated, and this picture. But we don't know anything about it because it just doesn't match our view of the solar system and the history of the earth, which is what cosmology is all about. Anyway, back to the story. Talbot said this is the way it was aligned. And because it was lined up like that, the picture now looked like this. Here's Saturn, and here's Venus, and here's Mars inside of Venus. And the crescent, instead of falling on rings, basically Saturn was ringless. The crescent appeared on the planet Saturn itself, instead of on the rings. And the pillar was still there, Earth's horizon here, and the cruciform figure did appear later. So all of these elements are still there in this revised version. And why is that important? Because Mars and Venus play an important role in the mythology of the entire world. And they play an important role in creating the many images that are referenced by the ancients, not just the prophets, but all ancient cultures. So with this revised story, which I now emphasize in my online classes, the scriptures become much easier to understand. How we fit scripture for time, Steve? There's no clock, so I can't. It's uh, 7.40. Oh, I want to try to stay within the time. <laughs> So, then the concept was there. That's what's in the book. Now it has changed, but the imagery has remained exactly the same. And it's, we've added a whole bunch 
we've added we've added the uh, uh, well for want of a better word we'll call it the, the scallop shell this sort of an image forgive my art Which is, which is where all the crowns of antiquity come from. We've added, we've added the, uh, oh gosh, there's not gonna be enough room for all of them. Uh, I suggest you take the classes, I outline all of these symbols in the classes. And, and the beauty of it is that understanding it now with these added features, now we can understand mythology, we can understand sacred tradition, and we can understand the prophets. Why can we understand the prophets? Simple answer. The prophets, gosh, I've made it. The prophets from Adam to Joseph Smith, have used these very same symbols. Why? Because it is the universal language of mankind. It's our culture is the only one that doesn't teach this symbolism as part of their religion or part of their cultural training. Only the Western cultures are, have erased all of this from our tradition and we pushed it over to myth and legend. And that's why reading uh, children's fairy tales sounds very much like reading the scriptures. There are dragons, and there are monsters, and there are kings and queens, and there are swords and ships, and you name it. Because it's drawing on this universal language of mankind. So this, this is the difference this is the change that occurred. Did you have something? That the sacred feminine is part of this is the sacred feminine, <laughs> Venus. My wife is just. Yeah. I can't imagine why she likes that part. <laughs> She's here to balance the equation. She... That's right. Speak up for this time. There you go. You're kind. You mean your gender? <laughs> we are the same kind, just a different gender, sweetie. <laughs> okay. This is important. No, I, I, I'm teasing her. But what she's saying is absolutely right. Well, we have Aphrodite in the shell above the veil in Salt Lake Temple. Yeah, what, what Steve's talking about is, is the meaning of the symbolism in our temples. And it, 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 it may as well not, the room may as well be just as empty as this one is. It's full of symbolism. Any room that you're in in the temple is full of symbolism, but it may as well be just as empty as this room because we don't see it. Because our culture has said this stuff belongs in mythology. The word mythology is synonymous with fabrication, with invention. But mythology is the record that our um, ancestors left us to try to tell us what they saw. And every prophet of God that's been called, including Joseph Smith, was shown this business in vision. And if you don't believe me, take my classes. I explain it in there. And I will explain it to your satisfaction. Please take them in order. Don't jump around because you like the title of one lesson over another. Start at number one and work your way through. 
This stuff is so different than anything you've ever read before that unless you do that, you will be either lost or you will be discouraged and think it's useless. I told you this was going to be a pitch unabashedly. The only way I can teach 10,000, 10 million Latter-day Saints the truth about these things is to publish it. And the only way I can publish it is to charge for it because they charge me. Just like, just like Deseret Book charges me to keep this book on the shelf, I have to pay them four-tenths, what's that, two-fifths of the profit of the book so they'll put it on the shelf. I have to do that. That's the way we distribute. And people accuse me, oh, you're charging, that's, that's priestcraft. That's nonsense. Priestcraft is when you charge for the ordinances. But teaching, Joseph Smith said, the um, laborer is worthy of his hire. Okay. Sorry, that's just one of my bugaboos. <laughs> okay. Everybody got all this now because I'm going to erase it. And I'm going to summarize how much time I got left, Stephen. You got 13. I'll let you know when it's 8. Okay. I'm going to summarize so that you can see why this is important. Every world that has ever been created, that our Father in Heaven has ever created, or any of His contemporaries have ever created, was created the same way our world was created. We are not a unique knockoff. We are just one of untold numbers of planets that have been populated by the descendants of the gods, if you will. I know that's radical doctrine in the church today, but it still exists, and you can't be condemned for saying it. It's there. It's there. Okay. So, if, if, uh, if, if the Lord's going to call you, Ryan, to be a prophet, what is he going to want to communicate to you? Do you think the history... of your planet is going to be important? That would be one of the most important, yeah. yeah. Why, do you, why do you think the sub... What, sweetheart? And the future of your planet. Well, that, that, that by implication is exactly right. This is why when you go to the temple, the very first thing you experience is... the story of the creation. This is why it's important. All the prophets saw the same vision. It is the one story told in antiquity, and it's told in our temples. You ever notice that when you went to the temple? This is the one story? I'm not talking about the movie, the never-ending story. I'm talking about the one story. All the prophets had to see that. The, 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 all the prophets had to see this alignment of planets that Joseph Smith drew, the, the, the nested planets, the eye of God, the four rivers that flowed out of Eden, the world mountain, the, the mountain of the Lord's house. This, this is the Lord's house the tree on life. top. The tree of life. This is the mountain. The one that Nephi said is exceedingly high, higher than any I've ever seen. Of course, it I've was cosmic. What's that? He also says, I've never been to. Never been to before. They're all shown the same vision. Nephi, Ezekiel, John, Daniel, all of them. Joseph Smith, all of them. So that they will know when they encounter this, all of these, all these elements, these symbols, um, Yeah. I knew there was a letter missing there somewhere. Forgive me. I'm not a writer after all. 
all these symbols gave rise to imagery or metaphors in ancient cultures. Now the Lord tells us in the in, uh, Book of Mormon, I speak to all nations, but I speak in a language that they understand. That's why the Enuma Elish, which is the Babylonian creation story, sounds like a fairy tale, but that was what they understood. So that's how the Lord spoke to them. We read it and it doesn't read like Doctrine and Covenants, so we say, well, that can't be scripture. Genesis sounds like a fairy tale. Too. Yeah, well, so the truth of the matter is the Lord has revealed his will to all cultures in all time. This has been their tradition. And the prophets have gone forth and used all these symbols or images to preach the gospel. Why? Because it was a great teaching tool. If your culture told a story about, about Mars and Venus, this is, and uh, Ryan is animating this right now, and we'll have it in the video, about Mars descending to the earth, you know, here's, here's from our point of view, there's our horizon there. This picture of Mars descending, first he's here, and, and with the crescent, it looks like he's got horns. And then as he descends further, he gets larger and larger and larger until he becomes a mountain on the edge of the earth. Then he returns again to where he was, where he started from. Does that story sound at all familiar? Yeah, Jack and Jill. We talked about that in the lessons. It's it's the story of uh, Aladdin. Is it two elves? Mm -hmm. Thank you. The story of, it's the story of Aladdin. It's the story of uh, uh, who's the hero of the Odyssey? Well. It's the story of Jason and the Argonauts. Jack and the Beanstalk. It's Jack and the Beanstalk. It's the story, there's, there are others, and I'm trying to think of what they are. In, in the, uh, it's the story of Horus in the Egyptian. It's the story of um, uh, Hercules. Uh, anyway, my point, and this week I cover in the lesson. Well, then condescension. But it's, uh, huh? Condescension. And it's called the condescension of God. Yeah. It yeah, means, and you go it below means, all and, so and, could go up. And we sing it in our hymns. He descended from his throne on high. Yeah. Why do we speak about Christ that way? Because that was the language. That's the imagery. Why do we speak of Christ as a king? And the church, the church as his bride. What does the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins mean? Why are there seven of them? Why are there seven beasts in John's revelation? Why are there seven seals? Why are there seven angels? Why are there seven anything? Seven days. days of the week? Why seven? Because it all goes back to these images and symbols that were seen in the heavens anciently. Is it no wonder that Christ's apostles teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to a cultural mix of five or six different ancient cultures, is it no wonder that John didn't, that John used all of their traditions in his little missionary tract that we know as Revelation? Because
because the beasts and the kings and the candlesticks and um, the dragon and the mountain and the angels and all of that are allusions to the tr cultural traditions of his day that draw on this business right here. And isn't it true that he used those symbols because they can be understood in multiple languages? That's exactly right. Yeah. This, this is, oh, I, wrote, I took it down. Why did I do that? This is the universal language of mankind. It is the common denominator, to, to use a term from mathematics. And the Lord says in, in the Book of Mormon, he says, you know, um, you're, you Gentiles, you're going to be judged out of these books. And we don't even realize they're scripture. But they are. They are the teachings of the prophets to that particular culture at that particular time. The four, the four corners of the earth that Joseph Smith points out in the Pearl of Great Price in that hypocephalus facsimile, the nice brown one. He says these four beasts represent the four cardinal directions of the earth. They represented the four cardinal directions of the heaven as well. Everything on the heaven was in the heavens was translated and placed on the earth using these same symbols. As above, so below. That's the key language. As above so below thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in the heavens that same that's the language in the Lord's prayer thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven every temple raised by every culture in every part of the world reflects some of these elements seen in the heavens. That's why a temple can be four square or it can be round. There's still a temple. It can be a stonehenge or it can be a pyramid because of this mountain. Those are nothing, the Egyptian pyramids are nothing but sacred mountains. Duplicates of things seen in the heavens anciently. So, this is a whole new way of looking at the scriptures. A whole new way of looking at history. And for Latter-day Saints, it's a whole new way of looking at the restored gospel that explains scriptural symbolism the imagery used by the prophets in their visions, and the temple rituals and icons. What's on the outside of the Salt Lake and the Nauvoo temples? Because those are the quintessential temples of the Restoration. Who can tell me what's on the outside of those buildings? Cosmology. Stars and planets. Stars, planets, constellations. Saturn. Saturn. Would it would it surprise you if I said that's what the in the rituals on the inside are all about? I'm not talking about the covenants. I'm not talking about the promises that are made. I'm talking about everything else. You can go to the temple and you could take out your covenants and make the promises and leave in ten minutes. But why do you have to dress in those funny clothes? And why do you have to go from room to room? And why do you have to do any of the things that you do in the temple? Because it's all reminiscent of this. And it starts, like I said, with the creation. When you go to the temple, people, you are walking in the footsteps of the prophets. You are seeing ritually the vision that they saw in reality. And you don't even know it.
this is the crime. Now, I understand that the church can't go publish, public with this sort of stuff because we already have uh, a reputation as being a cult. And the majority of Christianity would look at this stuff and say, foul, that's, that's uh, demonic, that's a, that's a, you're a cult. So I understand why the church doesn't publicly uh, support or teach any of this stuff. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility. It's like Nibley wrote, we go to the temple and we covenant to live the law of consecration. We go home and ignore it. We're not learning what we were intended to learn. We think it's been handed to us. We think that everything there is is what is publicly available when in fact it's our responsibility to dig it up. I like Abraham. Abraham says, I wanted the knowledge of the fathers. He doesn't say the priesthood. He doesn't say, talk about the savior directly. He doesn't talk about, he says, I want the knowledge of the fathers. And along comes, uh, oh, who's the last prophet in the Old Testament? Help Malachi, me. maybe? Yeah, uh, where he says, I'll turn the hearts of the children to the father and the fathers to the children. That's what this is about. That's what Abraham's talking about. Our hearts have to be turned to the fathers. They did everything they could to communicate this stuff to us, and we don't know anything about it. We've, we've ignored it. But the whole, all the imagery, the gospel, and the restoration, scripture... Uh, the, that's why Pearl of Great Price is such a neglected scripture. We don't understand it. It's just as well be a sealed book. Oliblish, the world is that about? Anyway, I get pretty passionate about this, and maybe I overstate my case a little bit. Uh, I had someone tell me recently, well, I, I had a hard time understanding what you were talking about because it all seemed natural. There was no room for the spiritual in this. Of course, it's all about the spiritual. But you have to understand the temporal side of the gospel to clearly see the spiritual side. And the Lord explains that in Doctrine and Covenants. All things have their spiritual and temporal equivalents. But, but, but we don't know what the temporal equivalents are because no one has ever... Well, I'm trying to... I'm trying to make Latter-day Saints see. Stephen has taken my classes. Ryan has taken my classes. Does it explain anything? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so much. It, it, uh, Does, do I, the, are the scriptures more meaningful to you? Yeah. Is the temple meaningful to you? Yeah. Does it add to your testimony? Oh yeah, I mean some of the funny. Let me things, hear an amen. <laughs> amen. Well, some of the funny things that you always read, and like, what in the world is that there for? Make complete sense to me because it's those images. Yeah. They're they're bringing us back to that. Like Tony says, it's, there's the spiritual side and the temporal side. They're both there. Yep. Jeremiah is speaking to Jews. I think before the diaspora, before the, before the time of the uh, uh, captivity of Babylon, Daniel is speaking to an entirely different audience. Oops. Daniel's speaking to an entirely different audience that has now been, knows nothing about Jeremiah's time. All they know is the Jews in exile in Babylon, and they know the Babylonian tradition. So what does, what does Daniel allude to? The Babylonian tradition. So in Daniel, you're seeing Babylonian tradition used to, to explain gospel imagery. Jeremiah was explaining Egyptian and, uh, and early Hebrew tradition using that in his explanation. Well, you come down to John in the book of Revelation 
And John is writing to uh, Jews, uh, uh, Egyptians, uh, Greeks, Romans, and Persians. And so in John's revelation, you get a mix of all of these traditions, not just one of them. But they're all telling the same story. How do I know that? Well, you can see it. In, in John's revelation, there are four beasts. And there are four horsemen. In, um, in Daniel, there are four beasts. The beasts are various. They, they change a little bit because it's Babylonian tradition now. It's not Greek or Roman tradition. And, and the same thing with Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Seven horses or four beasts. And they all see these same things in vision. They're all seeing the same vision. They talk about it in terms of contemporary religion in their day. You cannot see that until you master the principles of the polar configuration. It is the common denominator, the universal language of all mankind, and the language that the Lord uses in his revelations today just as he did anciently. And it's not meant to confuse us. It's because it was tradition. And the reason we can't understand it is because science came along and said, ignore the man behind the curtain. Okay? He's not there. There's nobody pulling. There's nothing. Pay no attention. These are not the droids you're looking for. Move along. <laughs> and so our slate is clean. We know nothing of this stuff. And believe me, it takes a little time and effort to master it. But if you're willing to do it, as a couple of people here tonight have attested, if you're willing to do it, it is going to enhance your gospel knowledge many, many fold. It's going to strengthen your testimony. And when people come up and begin assaulting you because of what you believe, it will do no good because you know you have this background. You're part of the universal humankind. Something that God honors, the prophets honor, and we should honor. Anyway. One, one thing I just want to say real quick. I know some people get a little scared when they take the, class, the classes. Yeah. Fear is not from God. If God was telling you not to do it, he would do it in a peaceful manner. Yeah. God is of peace, not of fear. I, 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 what more can I say, folks? If, if, if this doesn't entice you to read the books and watch the lessons, nothing will. And there's nothing I can add to it except to say that I have discharged my responsibility to this generation by teaching them the things that the prophets were talking about. And now it's the ball's in your court. And it's up to you whether you study these things and learn them and benefit from them. Sooner or later, you might as, you're going to learn them, whether it's in this life or the next. It will all become obvious sooner or later. But the beauty in knowing it now is it lets you appreciate the church and the prophets and the restoration. It lets you appreciate the cultural tradition that you come from. And it gives you the strength to move forward when things get really ugly with current controversial issues. And I hope you'll take advantage of that. Okay.